a training. We still have plan to, to, to invite you properly for, for this training. Mr. Dari Joseph, please, can you please come online and uh, kindly take over this session? And as much as you can, let us learn from you. Mr. Dari Joseph, kindly unmute yourself. Are you there, sir? While we are with our, our trainer, our facilitator for today's training. Mr. Dari Joseph, yes, are you yeah. there? I'm here. I'm here. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Sorry, I have to call you uh, on, on August <laughs> as an emergency procedure. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite unfortunate well, that we have a lot of people who joined us today, and the network has been so, has been so frustrating. But I believe that your network uh, will be, will be better. So please, um, it, 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 it's 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 um, it's going to be to make it easier for you. We have um, when someone faints or goes unconscious, and then when maybe someone takes poison, and I, I know when someone gets injured, maybe fell on the floor, or you know, there are three different categories now. When someone faints, goes unconscious, or when someone uh, has a cardiac arrest, or when someone falls down and gets injured, blood or anything. And from the fourth one, when someone takes a poisonous substance, maybe a little child who takes a poisonous substance, please, you can actually play around this. And I know that you can exhaust this. Within one hour, two hours, three hours, as much as you can. Please, Candy, you have the floor, sir. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, good evening, uh, Ogavi. <laughs> so, what I would like to, before I go on, uh, in fairness to the host, and as you said, to in response to uh, a question posted by a participant. Uh, Really, this, this is unfortunate that in our own environment, we see struggle uh, over data. And this is not just uh, peculiar to uh, this kind of setting. I've been in very organized programs where the uh, presenter could not do anything. And when I mean very organized, I mean international level kind of program. So this, this tends to happen in our environment. And... Uh, I want us to be sure that we've exhausted our options with Yemi. Uh, I hope you've, as uh, Mr. Yemi, I hope you've uh, contacted him so that we don't uh, dive into his uh, papers. You know, it can be yeah uh, similar uh, in discussion. Yeah, yeah, I understand you, and um, that is why we are, I'm here to to make it much more organized. You know, in as much as we are waiting for him, also we have almost exhausted an hour. And we have not gone deep into the main topic of the day. And we have people who are still patient till now. At least we see our 53 people who are still patient till now to, to be in this session. So I'm going to give him a call while he continue, while he continue to educate these people. So when he come in, we will, we will tell him and I would inform him on where to continue from. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So fine then. Uh, I'm okay to that. Um, when it comes to... Emergency preparedness, uh, uh, first aid, disaster management. Uh, I'm always ex excited, and uh, I, I, I'm not sure this is something I should say, but as you may have observed, that I've not always joined your session. But anything that has to do with emergency seems to to excite me. I know that I don't want to join. Like everybody cannot always join, but uh, we. We are in a world where we are even overloaded with some of these uh, programs and so Sometimes there's fatigue, there's uh, lethargy, there's malaise, and what have you. So uh, thanks again, thanks for the privilege and unfortunate for INE. Uh, I'm sure he's excited about this as well. So let me just uh, move on. Uh, I'm not. I'm not going to be sharing any slides. So uh, this will just be something you listen to. I would like to go back to fainting and to your uh, story, Wally. It's, it's not uncommon. It's unfortunate that the citizenry is quite uneducated when it comes to uh, emergency preparedness, uh, emergency response, first aid, particularly because some of these things are quite, quite basic. They are very simple, straightforward, basic things to do. Uh, so, uh, uh, one of the things I used to say, even beyond uh, bandaging, as, as you mentioned earlier, that uh, first aid is not just you know, applying those materials, there's the psychological aspect. There's also the 
uh, citizens' response, behavior, change of orientation. Uh, one of the international federation of Red Cross and Red Cross Society uh, policy guideline defined first aid as a state of mind. So it starts with our mind. Uh, we as a people, everyone here, uh, currently I have about 53 persons here. When you leave here, when you leave this call, after today, after this hour, how do you, you can immediately start affecting or affecting your environment by simply telling persons that, look, you know you can do this, you know you shouldn't do this. And uh, if, if you permit me also, I, I, I'll come to those questions, but I just think this thing is more, even more important than the skill itself. Um, for you, sometimes you don't even know what to do, but at least knowing that you keep a safe distance in certain circumstances is all you need to do. And that is, uh, that is also knowing. And uh, as I was saying, if you, if you would permit me to share my experience, just, just last week we were, um, and Yemitu was, we were together with Yemi. Yemitu was part of this program in Akoka where uh, I led a team, we provided uh, about six hours of emergency, pre community emergency preparedness and response training for over a hundred community members. And Yemi was quite helpful, uh, thanks to him as well. And every other person that were involved, and one of, I, I kept emphasizing this because people have a lot of orientations, like in fire you don't shout, in snakes by you suck, in, you know, very very awkward uh, information. People are afraid to help, like you said, you took the courage, but you were afraid because the society has been designed so, and we are all involved. Everyone, uh, you find a situation where sometimes people. Uh, uh, you know, you leave this space and even after training, they get out there and they give excuses for not helping. Or oh, the police, the this, the that. And one of the questions I used to pose to people is that, what if you were the victim? And the thing that you can't be the victim is a lie. If you come from the perspective of religion, some of the most religious people have been involved in all sorts of incidents, including kidnapping, murder, uh, plane crash, car accidents. So if you think, oh, God is on your side. Yeah, God is on everybody's side, but this tends to happen. 3,500 people are killed every day on the road. Over 600,000 people are killed as a result of fall and trips and fall every year globally. Over 400,000 people are killed globally as a result of bonds. Over 300,000 people are killed uh, every year globally as a result of non-intentional poisoning. Over 100,000 people are killed globally as a result of uh, venomous snake bites. There are 5 million uh, snake bites in, uh, happening every year in the world. Over 50 million people suffer from epilepsy. Over 15 million people globally suffer from stroke and about 6 million people will die from the stroke. The remaining 5 uh, million that have survived, another half, 50% uh, of that population will suffer a secondary stroke, which is more uh, likely to going to take their lives. So there's a lot of reasons. We are humans, we are wonderfully created, or if you don't believe in creation, let's say evolution, everything works fine. But in the end, first state is beyond, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it's just basically a state of mind. Uh, since uh, Yemi is back, I would like to back off from the technical uh, discussion and just let's let's reason on this. Let's let's ruminate on the idea that, that uh, you know, first aid is a mindset. We have to change our minds. We have to change our behavior uh, when it comes to emergency preparedness and response. Uh, I, I would hold on at this moment. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you, sir. Um, we have a facilitator for back for the training. Mr. Dari Dussel, I really appreciate the time you uh, helped us in covering and the little exposure you just gave us now. So it, it's even beyond someone painting, it's beyond the skill itself, it's about humanity, it's beyond uh, 
um, someone going unconscious, it's beyond the injury, it's beyond someone taking, po taking poison. It also involves snake bites, bones, water bones, fire uh, bone, or what do you call it, eat bone. So many things that have to do with first aid. And I've really added that, that, that has really added to the knowledge I have on, on first aid. And it has reminded me of so many things that I've learned from you. So we have our facilitator back. We hope the network we know. Yes, the first the, the slide is clearer now. The slide is very clear now. Definitely the network should be clear. So please, in the next one hour, I want to do justice to this training. The slide is very clear now. What I'm seeing now is very clear. And I want everyone to confirm that the, what they are seeing now on the slide is very clear. Let us confirm that, that what we have on the slide is very clear. And let us go straight to the point now. I would, uh, uh, I would advise uh, our facilitator to please it go straight. Now. Yes, I would advise our, our facilitator to please go straight to the details, to the details of what we have, the main details of what state trainings are to, what are those aspects that we just mentioned. Let us just quickly go there directly and leave the, the introductory part and the lights. So please, uh, Mr. Ayani, over to you, sir. Okay, yeah, thank you very much, sir. So um, let me just, just start from here. Like, in case of emergency at home, um, anywhere at work and any situation you find yourself, please, um, when calling the emergency line, just give them some details that they need to know. Don't just call and tell them, hello, please come to our place. There is fire up. Please come to our place. Someone is injured, please. So when calling them, just give them the following details. Uh, because you tell them your name, you tell them the scene of the incident and um, the same situation, including the other present, the nature and the causes of the incident. So you have to let them know that as well. It's very important. The number of casualties that, that are involved, let them know as well. So the condition and the status of the casualties. So uh, you let them know this as well. It's very important to tell them and the progress of our stand giving. So please you tell them this too. And the location of the accident is very important too. By the time you tell them all this, um, they will know how to prepare themselves while coming and they will know what and what to bring while they are on their way. So please just, just tell them, they will, be, they will have full details of what is going on. Um, at the environment, why come in? So that's why you have to do this. And that's why you have to give them all these details and information concerning the um, situation of ground. So um, after then, so we can just tell, talk about uh, first aid materials and kits that we have. Uh, the first aid material in first aid kits, sorry, uh, that we have. So we have bandages. I won't be able to um, explain their uses anymore because of time. And we have 40 room. We have dust part, we have antiseptic wipe, we have adhesive tape, we have pin or clip, application, plaster, and adhesive bandages. Uh, we have scissors and forceps in the box, the stable glove as well. There is blanket, there is a tweezer, a top cut scissors, and uh, there is face marks with stretcher. So your stretcher is used for transportation of casualty, in case you want to transport your casualty, those are the things you're supposed to use to transport your casualty. So um, personal hygiene, while dealing with casualties, please ensure that you have to wash your hand frequently and um, ensure that you change your glove often as well, especially once you notice that your glove has been, um, has, has, has been so soaked with body fluid or you're, you, 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 you're about to touch a body fluid or you're trying to touch um, an open body. So please ensure you wash your hands and ensure that you use your, what's it called, uh, gloves. So please now, so we have to go to the, straight to the um, present of the day. So let's first uh, start from the basic life support, which is the basic condition of first aid. So when someone, um, um, is having life threatening condition, like such as uh, maybe someone develop, develop a cardiac arrest, and uh, what are the things you have to do to that person? Oh, but that was a that was, that was a this thing that was twenty then. Uh, what do you call Twitter post that was twenty then. When someone asks that, what is the emergency number of your community of your area, and someone have to respond, I had to go back by you. Sure, sure, because that is exactly that is exactly what people usually do when things happen at home. So there are some things you have to do first before you start shouting, uh, I like to go away, something like that. So 
just at the basis like support, you have to put in place. The basic condition you have to put in place in first aid. That what, what, what the things you have to ensure that you put in place. And um, by then, by the time you do all these things, um, there are steps for it. By the time you do all these things, you should be able to sustain someone back to life if ever uh, if possible. So that these are the things you have to do when you do your early recognition, you do your CPL. Uh, if there is defibrillator, you apply your defibrillator, and um, there is post exhaustion care, which is the ACLS. That's um, what I'm just going to talk about our own BLS now, which is the basic like support. And there are the first aid condition. You call them basic condition in first aid, or you call them first aid condition, or you call them basic like support. So you approach to the scene safely. By the time you get to the scene, do not panic. And when you get there, ensure that you check for danger, check for hazard, you check for whatever that is going to endanger you as well. As a first aider, what's going to endanger you, your casualty as well, and the bystanders too, people around, ensure that they are safe as well. By the time you do this, then you check for response. Once you check for response and you call the person's name, you shout to the two years, ensure that you shout to the two years of casualty, you tap the shoulder, gently by the time you do this then you should be able to know uh, if this person will respond or not so if this person doesn't respond that's when you have to shout for help you shout you shout for help so that um you shout you are shouting for help because you need someone you need someone to assist you why shouting for help that's why you're shouting for help. you need someone to assist you that's number one number two um you want to know if this person will respond to the shout because um, uh, we believe that the, the hearing organ is the last test of the organ that um, that travels when someone is sleeping. So if this even this person is sleeping, when I shout, I want to know if this person respond, and I want to shout because I need assistance. Even if this person is not responding, those are the two reasons you are shouting for help. So then you have to open the airway. You tilt up the 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 up head up head up, then you check for breathing. You are checking for breathing because you want to know if this person is breathing. Because if this person is breathing, you don't need to do your chest compression. You cannot do, you cannot perform CPR on someone that is breathing. That is why you are trying to check if this person is breathing. So once you check for breathing and you know that the person is breathing, then you have to place that person on recovery position. So I'm going to show you all this very soon. You place that person on recovery position. So once you place that person in the position, then you have to be checking your casualty to ensure that this person doesn't stop breathing anymore or doesn't stop breathing any longer. So that's why you are checking on someone that is on, um, that you are checking, trying to check on someone that you place on the public position. But once you check for the breathing and the person is not breathing, then you have to call the emergency management service. So once you call the emergency management service, so you tell them, as I said, you tell them your name, the number of casualty, the location, and the the, uh, the situation on ground. So you have to call them. And uh, we in Nigeria here we have um, um, seven six seven, or you call one one two. That's the emergency number of our uh, community. So I have, uh, of the yes of, of the of the state and the country. For Lagos State, we have uh, seven six seven. And seven, uh, 112 can go nationwide. So trying to call this number, then you have to start your CPL. So the chest, 30 chest compression. Fingertips are purple. You're having a hard time breathing. And your energy seems uh, Hello? Please can you continue. Can you, I've muted the person. Can you continue? Okay, okay, okay. So you have to do your 30 chest compression. And you do two mouth breath. The chest compression you are trying to do is to, you are trying to compress the chest. You are trying to compress the chest. Um, you are trying to compress the heart to the chest for 30 times. You are trying to try to pump the blood that remains in the bloody to the brain because the heart has stopped working. That was that is why you are doing your CPR. The heart has stopped working. That's why you are performing your CPR. Yeah, that's why you have to do your 30 chest compression. Then after the 30 chest operation, you do your two mouth breath to the casualty. You continue with 30 chest two mouth breath until that person comes to life. So um, this is it. If you are trying to compress now, 
You place your two heel of your palm at the center of the chest. You lock your hand with give 30 chest compression. Ensure that you are completely this is the center of the chest because the art is located at the center of the chest, not the right, not the left. The art is not at the left of the chest. The art is not at the right of the chest. The art is exactly at the center of the chest, under the ribs, where the two ribs meet. The, where the two ribs meet, we call it stalum. Under the stalum is where the art is located. That is why you can see the hand here. The hand here is, this hand here is trying to be located at the location of the art. Because where the position of the art, that's why you're trying to do that. That's for adults. That's for adults. You are giving 30 chest compression. Then you are giving two mark words to this person. So, um, I'm going to I'm going to play this video to you now, so you can see what I just what I just explained now. You can just also see it in the video here. So I I believe you can hear the video as well. You can hear the sound. Listen to the sound of the video. Yes, yes. In this video, okay. you will learn how to perform cardiopulmonary resuscitation following cardiac arrest in an adult. If the person loses consciousness, so that's this person's check the response. I know that he's shouting for help as well. Check that the casualty is still breathing. So you want to open the airway now. That's how to open the airway. And the fingers of your other hand beneath the tip of their chin. And he's going to check the person. If this person is breathing for ten seconds. If you see no breathing movement, hear nothing, nor feel their breath on your cheek, then the casualty is not breathing. Call the emergency services and, only if there is one nearby, go and fetch a defibrillator. If there are other people around you, ask someone else to fetch the defibrillator. In the absence of a defibrillator, or whilst waiting for someone to arrive with one, begin cardiopulmonary resuscitation. To do this, place the heel of the palm of your hand in the middle of the casualty's bare chest. Place your other hand on top of his hand and interlock your fingers. Position yourself directly above their chest with your so, arms. Um, so when when doing your CPR, please ensure that you lock the elbow of the casualty as well. Uh, uh, the the lock the elbow. Uh, the first thing I have to lock their elbow as well. It's very important. Ensure that you lock your elbow while while performing CPR. It's very important so that you can get the effectiveness of the. The compression into the heart. If you don't lock, if you don't lock the elbow, then um, the pressure you are trying to, to are trying to place on the chest won't be won't, won't be sufficient and won't be effective as well. So ensure that you lock the elbow. Hand in the middle of the casualty's bare chest. Place your other hand on top of his hand and interlock your fingers. Position yourself directly above their chest with your arms straight. Press down on the chest to depth of between 5 to 6 centimeters with both hands. Maintain a rhythm of 2 compressions per second. Alternate 30 chest compressions with 2 rescue breaths, but only if you know how to do them. Otherwise, perform chest compressions only. Hello, Hello. If you perform mouth-to-mouth -mouth breathing, do not forget to tilt the head back before each rescue breath and to be sure to check that the casualty's chest inflates. Continue cardiopulmonary resuscitation without stopping until the victim begins to breathe normally or the emergency services arrive or a defibrillator is brought to the scene. So once you have done this, in the first minutes immediately after cardiac arrest, the victim may breathe weakly or take irregular noisy gasps. These are known as gasps and should not be confused with normal breathing. So once you have done this and your casualty has come back to life, then you have to place your casualty on the public position. So once you are performing CPR as well and you feel that you want to stop CPR, these are the only reason you can stop spying. If there is this, this doesn't pop up, 
please, you can just continue your CPL. The other reason you can, can, you can try to stop CPL is that when you, you notice that the scene has become unsafe, maybe you are trying to perform CPL and you start shooting. So you have to live and save your life and move. So that's only when you can stop CPL. Or you stop CPR, you notice that a qualified person, a qualified help arrives to take over, then you can just stop your CPR. Please don't drag with them. Once you know that this person are qualified uh, personnel, the paramedics or the medics, and they arrive, don't drag, don't tell them that uh, I've, I've been the one that has been compressing so far. Please allow me to just make sure that I'm the hero of this person to ensure that this person comes back to life. No, don't argue with them. Stop CPR. And leave it to hand your cash out over to them. Let them continue from where, let them continue from where you stop, so that um, they can give uh, effective ones. And maybe from there they can also use advanced uh, cardiac life support to resuscitate that person back. That's why it is very important to hand your cash out over to them. And um, you see signs of life. Okay, now I said uh, you are going to give tight chest compression to mouth breath. You continue if there is no help, you continue, then if there is no sign of life, you continue 30 to two. So maybe you are compressing and at the at um, 16th or 17th um, compression, your cash actually come back to life. You can stop, it's not compulsory, you make it to 30. Since there is sign of life, you can say that, um, okay, this person has come back to life, um, returned back to life then, what, what are you, what, 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 why do you want to compress more? So that's why you have to stop CPR. Then you close your cash out into the top position. Remember, I said the other time that you are not supposed to compress on someone that is breathing. So, since that person has come with, uh, turn back to life, then stop CPL and that's fine. Then um, you notice that you are physically unable to continue. Please, you can, you can stop CPL if you are tired because um, you can get tired while, while performing CPL. So you can stop and you tell someone to continue. But if you notice that, okay, you guys are still physically um, able to continue at maybe at time, at many times as you can, then you can continue. But once you see that you are physically unable to continue, please, you can also stop CPR. And then the last one is that when authorized person pronounce life estate, then you have no choice to stop CPR. And remember, it, it is it is said that, that when an authorized person that means when a doctor or a qualified uh, person tells you that you continue when they tell you that someone Someone um, has stopped or uh, has stopped uh, tweeting, or someone is already dead. So, you can just stop spell. So, these are the reasons you can stop spell. Without this reason, you can just perform your CPR and just move. So, um, if you are performing your CPR and you are opportune to have your AED around you, so you can use your AED. So, AED, uh, the use of defibrillation is known as uh, using a um, uh, um, it, um, AED, that's an uh, automated external defibrillator. That's definition. That's what definition means. Then that's when you are using a machine, a machine that is going to instruct you on how to perform your CPR or how what to do on your casualty. The machine will tell you that he or she, yeah, he wants to deliver shock, you stay clear of the casualty. Then that's when you can also stop CPR. And that's when you can also use this machine. So the machine will just um, instruct you. The machine will tell you what to do. The machine will tell you, okay, um, apply pad on your casualty. So, okay, trying to analyze this person. So once the machine analyzes, the machine will tell you to stay clear of your casualty. You are staying clear because the machine is analyzing. But if, if you touch the person, the machine can also read you. And once the machine reads you, that means uh, you are, the, uh, the machine will also just read that this person is breathing. Understand? Or once the machine is trying to um, deliver shock, if you if you touch your casualty, it can be electrocuted. So, what this machine will also deliver shock on this person. So that's why um, you are supposed to stay clear. And this this is used to um, regulate the rhythm of the heart. 
that um, the, one of the function of the AD helps you to um, regulate the rhythm of the heart. So um, the, you have to follow the instructions of the AD if you want to perform um, AD. Okay, but the machine is the machine that will talk to you on what to do. That's the machine is your commander will command you to what to do. Okay, do this, do that. Um, perform CPR, stop CPR, give to mouth breath. Okay. Okay, if this person is placing okay, place in cover position, the machine will tell you what to do. That's why it is known as um um estimated external system because it is autom automatic, so it's it have to every to meet and tell you what to do. So um let's just try to watch this video on um on the defibrillation. Call 999. Tell so, him he's not breathing. Okay, okay. Ambulance, please. A gentleman's collapsed. He's not breathing. Duncan! Quick, get the AED. It's over there. Hurry! Where is the AED machine? Round the corner, on the wall. It is. Quick, open it. So uh, you ensure that uh, when having your AD at home or your estate, the AD should be accessible for everybody. That's how it's supposed to be. AD is not someone, something that you have to have and someone has to be holding the key. In case emergency or incident happens, what if the person that has the key is not around or the person that has the key is the casualty? What's going to happen? So please, AD is supposed to be very accessible for everybody to use. It's not something that is hidden or have to be hide from someone. So, so let me also play this video for you as a other video on cases. Let's say a person brings an AED. Now what will you do? Will you stop? Will you wait? Or will you carry out your uh, CPR? Let's see in this video. Remove clothes from patient's chest. Patient's chest is bare. Open gray plastic case and peel off white adhesive pads. Carefully at the pictures on the white adhesive pads. Peel one white pad from the gray case. Place pad exactly as shown. Press firmly to bare skin. When the first pad is in place, peel the second pad. Place pad exactly. 
exactly as shown. Stay clear of patient. Analyzing heart rhythm. Stay clear of patient. Analyzing heart rhythm. Doc advised. Stay clear of patient. Press the flashing orange button now. Shock delivered. Be sure emergency medical services have been called. So uh, is... the machine is going to tell you what. Can you see now? The machine will tell you what to do. And if you, if you let you know when to give CPR, and when to st stop CPR, and when to continue CPR. So that's how it's going to be. So I know I said it the other time that once your casualty has been covered, or you check for waiting and you notice that this person is quitting, then you have to place on the recovery position. So this is what how the recovery position looks like. So you place your casualty to one side and uh, make that person sleep comfortably. You open the airway so that the the so the factors of the recovery position is that you ensure that the jaws is forward, the mind is low ground, the, uh, the the chest is also off ground, and the back is straight. These are the four factors you have to put in place while putting someone on a cover position. Jaw have to be jaw have to be forward, um, chest have to be off off the ground, back have to be straight, and then mouth have to be low to ground. So in case this thing will help to open the airway of casualty. And in case still that person wants to vomit, it is very easy for that person to vomit easily. And with this, the airway is open so that the person can be able to breathe very well, well with, with this. So look at it now. This is first stage. This is the first stage of the recovery position. You have to put this hand here. And beside you here, you have to put it on angle 90 degree, or you put it L shape. We call it L shape or 90 degree. And after then, after you've done this, you have to pick. You pick this hand, this is it. You put it at the stick of the casualty. Then you have to raise the leg up. Once you get the leg up, so you roll the casualty to your side. So that's how it is. Then you roll the casualty to your side. So this is a video of coming to the show. Please um, just enjoy the video as well. In this video, you will learn how to put an unconscious person who is breathing normally in the recovery position. Lay the casualty on their back and ensure that their legs are together in line with the rest of the body. Kneel down on one side of the person. Place the arm that is nearest to you at a right angle to their body, ensuring that their hand is pointing upwards towards their head. Take their other arm and place the back of their head against their ear, which is nearest to you. Hold this position. Keep the palm of your hand pressed against theirs. Take hold of their leg which is furthest from you from the back of the knee. Lift it so that it bends at the knee joint, but make sure that their foot remains on the floor. With their leg bent, roll the victim over towards you to place them onto their side so that their knee touches the floor. Remove your other hand from their theirs, making sure that their head does not move from this position. Make a right angle with the leg you have just used to roll them over. Open their mouth, making sure not to move their head too much. Cover and monitor them, paying close attention to their breathing until the emergency so, um, services let's arrive. Go to, um, if the casualty Australia, is lying on their stomach and breathing... one of the things that actually happen at home. So, okay, someone is eating and musically, um, that person has to be shocked uh, with a... Uh, whatever your she is eating so um, let's just try to demonstrate um what shocking is all about so if you want to know if someone is shocking shocking is of two 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 uh, type we have a, a mild shocking and we have a uh, severe shocking if it's mild one that means um, the person will still be able to talk and can still cough by itself and will still be able to respond with his or her mouth that's mild shocking but if it is um severe shocking Severe shocking, that is when that person will be responding with just head, nodding head. That's severe shocking. That person will be nodding his or her head because that person doesn't know uh, what, that person cannot talk because the air passage has been blocked. I want to know if someone is choking, then that person will have this difficulty in, in speaking, difficulty in breathing as well. They have restlessness, 
there will be gas fee in the air and there will be sinusis and also cyanosis may occur. That's when you notice that um, the faces or uh, the part of the body will be bluish or pinkish. So that's how well, there will be discoloration in the part of the body. That's what uh, cyanosis usually do. So um, these are the things you have to do if you want to, if you want to I attempt to someone that has um, to, if it is just mind tripping, just tell that person to cough. That person will cough out what is wrong. Then that person will be fine. But this is for severe choking because the severe choking we need um, first aid attention. So that's for severe choking, and that means the air passage has been blocked completely. We encourage that person to cough. Once that person cough, you give five back blows. Tap the back five blows, check the mat for obvious obstruction. You give five abdominal thrusts. You call the abdominal thrust or you call it eminent maneuver, and you give chest. You give uh, you check the mat again for any obstruction, any, any obstruction. So you repeat this sequence three times. Once you repeat three times, then you call the EMS, that's emergency management services. You call them once you notice that you have done this time this thing three times and there is no no change so you have to call them so you continue the sequence again that's the three the five back blue and ten, five abdominal thrust so you check your casualty once that person has stopped breathing then that's why you have to perform your cpr so that's what we just done the other time um, the cpr the cardio premier. that's why cpr learning is very important at home it's very, it's very important we know uh, the how to perform CPR is very important. The management of choking. If someone is choking, this, these are the things you have to do to that person. In this video, you will learn to administer first aid to a person over the age of one who is choking. So this, oh, sorry. So that's um, my um, choking. There are three possible scenarios. Scenario one, the casualty is breathing, but with difficulty. Person to cough and don't do anything else. Coughing is the most effective way of dislodging. So that's my choking. Doing anything else could worsen the so situation. So in case of severe choking, scenario uh, two, choking now. the casualty is not breathing but is still conscious. Support their upper body with one hand and lean them forward. Give them up to five sharp back blows between their shoulder blades with the heel of your hand. If the back blows don't work, alternate with a series of five abdominal thrusts. Place your hand, clenched, in a fist in the middle of the abdomen, just below the sternum, in the hollow of their stomach. Place your other hand over it. Bend the casualty forward. Pull sharply inwards and upwards. Alternate five back blows with five abdominal thrusts until the casualty is breathing normally. Scenario 3. None of these procedures has worked and the casualty loses consciousness. Call or get someone to call the emergency services and start cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Alternating 30 chest compressions with two rescue breaths. If you don't know how to give mouth to mouth breathing, do chest compressions only at a rate of two per second. Continue CPR until medical help arrives or the casualty starts breathing normally. If the choking person is obese or pregnant and you're unable to grasp your hands around them to perform abdominal thrusts, you can alternate back blows with chest thrusts. So um, let's go to running. So for people that are having uh, pools in their, ha their home or in their estate or in the community and uh, something like this happens. So uh, once you notice that someone is running, 
That is just a replacement of uh, water into the lungs. That's what that is. So, and drowning is not all about water in the stomach, water in the head, or water in the in the uh, body of the casualty. So, once you know that someone is drowned, please don't press the stomach of that person. You are trying to endanger that person. You are exposing that person to second drowning, and even if that person has been drowned, has been covered. Yeah. So, don't press. Don't press the stomach. Don't just if you if the number one thing you have to do is that if not if you know that you are not a lifeguard, please don't rescue someone that is drowning. It's very wrong because you can also be drowned in process of um, assisting someone. So it is only a certified or qualified lifeguard that can um, rescue someone from the water. So the only thing you can do is that wait, let them rescue that person to you, and once that person has been rescued. And um, you notice that that person is still breathing. You don't need to press, you don't need to um, tap, you don't need to do anything. Just place that casualty on a recovery position. That's all. Place the casualty on a recovery position. That's the only thing you can do to a drowning, a drowned casualty that is breathing. So, um, so just once you get out the casualty, the casualty is rescued, rescue, lay down the casualty on their block. On them back on the blanket, open the airway, then you check their breathing. Treat the casualty for hypothermia because and shock. Because 25 for that means that person has we surely have low body temperature because that person has stayed a long period uh, in the water. So that person will have um, hypothermia because uh, due to low body temperature. So that's after then you have to treat for hypothermia by covering the person or by um, eating, placing that person on, in a uh, heated uh, environment so that that person, that body temperature will be warm. Then you place that person on the recovery position. Then you seek medical uh, uh, attention, arrange for medical attention. That's the only thing you can do. Please don't, don't, don't um, start uh, compressing the chest of the casualty if that person is still breathing or you start compressing the stomach of that person. You can only compress the chest or give CPR when that person has stopped breathing after that person has been recovered from the water. That's the only thing you can do. That's the only thing that you just try to give CPR when that person has stopped breathing. But if that person is not conscious as a result of that running, is still conscious, is still breathing, just place on the covered position, fit uh, for hypothermia and shock, then you can give um, hot fluid to drink if that person recovers fully. Can just if that person cover fully and that person still feeling cold, can just prepare maybe hot tea or maybe warm water to drink so that that person will, will feel the uh, feel the heat. That's just what can do on drowning. So now we're talking about unconsciousness. Uh, Causes just these are the causes of unconsciousness. Uh, we have fainting. The 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 acronym says fish shapes. That's the that's the acronym of this thing. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear, loud and clear. Please continue. Okay, okay, okay. So um the acronym says um fish shapes. So these are the um causes. These are the the, the condition, medical conditions that links into unconsciousness. Um, number one is fainting. Number two is imbalance body temperature or body heat. Uh, that's why we have hypothermia and hypothermia. So when the body temperature is high, it is known as hypothermia. But when the body temperature is low, it's known as hypothermia. We have shock. We have head injury, which is a concussion and compression. That's the injury, head injury we have. Then stroke. Hypoxia, heart attack, anaphylaxis, and anesthesia. We have poisoning, epileptic fit, that um, compulsion. That's when the compulsion is composed and diabetic emergency. So this kind, of, this kind of thing, surely happen at home. They happen, most of them happen at home. And if something like this happens at home, what are the things we are going to do? So for fainting, you notice that someone um, is fainted. Brain fainting is the is, is a temporary collapse due to inadequate supply of oxygenated blood into the brain. That's the what fainting is. So uh, you notice that someone has been collapsed and uh, due to inadequate of 
oxygenated blood to the brain, then um, don't pour water on that person. Don't pour water, don't wake that person up, don't tap that person. No, it is very wrong. You are, you, you are also introducing shock by the time you are doing all those things. Setting that person down and tapping that person, someone has already fainted. Please let that person lie down with your back uh, upright and then um, then you raise and support the lower extremity so that uh, you try to allow blood to flow to the brain on the casualty recovers. That's the only thing you can do to that uh, the casualty. You can see this that this leg is raised, is being raised up on the on on the on the surface or on the uh, material so that um, the blood from this lower extremity, blood from here will flow to the brain. That's why uh, so you can cover with blanket. Then you can seek medical advice. So don't pour water on that person. Don't uh, tap. Don't uh, don't start giving blood or something. Just by the time you are doing this and know that that person has covered, place in cold position. But doing this and they are still watching that person, then you watch that person and uh, when that person go unconscious, that's when you breathe chest compression. So if that person doesn't go unconscious and still conscious, because if you take a casualty will still communicate with you. Or might not be, be fully uh, communicated with you, but partially we still communicate with you. Can be using signs to communicate with you. So that's just what we do. So uh, please just watch this. And it's better to Thank If someone's feeling faint, advise them to lie down. Kneel down next to them and raise their legs, supporting their ankles on your shoulder or a chair if available to help blood flow back to the brain. Watch their face as signs that they are recovering. Make sure that they have plenty of fresh air. Ask bystanders to move away. And if you're inside, ask someone to open a window. They should recover within a couple of minutes. As they recover, reassure them and help them to sit up slowly when they are feeling better. If they don't become responsive again, quickly open their airway, check their breathing and prepare to treat someone who is unresponsive. So remember, if someone's feeling faint, lie them down and raise their legs. Make sure they have plenty of fresh air and when they recover and are feeling better, help them to sit up slowly. If they remain unresponsive, Prepare so to treat the management of fainting. So just risk up the lower extremity. By the time you raise up the leg, let flow, blood flow back to the brain. That's just the definition. That's what you're different of fainting. So fainting is different from unconsciousness. Fainting only leads to unconsciousness. Fainting is not unconsciousness. And in fainting, someone can still someone will still be fainting and can still be communicate with you. So that's fainting. So um, from in convulsion, some, if someone is convulsing, especially epileptic feet, someone is having epilepsy uh, and convulsing. So please, this these are these are these are the recognition of convulsion. Just see that the, there is involuntary spam of the muscle because it's going to be the muscle is going to be involuntary because the other person will be convulsing and it's not the person that is controlling the body anymore. So the person, the person will be chucking up and down, hitting their leg or head on the surface. That will be impaired um, consciousness. There will be signs of fever, such as high body temperature, um, congested face. There will be dropping of saliva from their mouth. There will be cyanosis and gradual sub subsidence. So in this, you just notice that the the drop the drop of saliva from their mouth. Um, if you see them drop the saliva, dropping a white foam in their mouth, it is that white foam is saliva, it's just a thick saliva. So um, it, they don't run away from them. They, that's when they need you. But do not hold them while they are conversing. Do not hold them because as you are holding them, as they are conversing, you are delaying the time of recovery. They have an episode or series of, uh, of step of uh, things they have to pass through. They have to pass through two that five steps before they recover. So by the time you hold them while they are conversing, then you are delaying the time of recovery. So once you notice that they are conversing, just leave them. Clear the surrounding for them, guide their heads, um, guide the sides 
so that they, they won't, um, what do you call, guys decide that they won't fall into any pit or any kind of um, um, a, a, a danger zone. So help them guide the, their side and guide their head so that they will not hit their head on the wall or on the ground. So that's what you can do for them. Just help them to guide, so to guide them and with this, you'll be able to, they'll be fine. Just make a street around the casualty and prevent injury. That's why you're trying to help them clear the surround. So, so you ask the bystanders uh, to wait, they to move away. But there are still some people that still want to wait and see what is going on. So you just tell them to move away so that um, this person will have uh, free space to, to jack or convulse. Because if this person has to convulse, then they have to protect their head. It's very important. So if you don't protect their head, um, it can lead to, this can lead to Concussion, that is head injury, which can lead to um, unconsciousness, especially puma. So ensure that you guide their head so that they will not hit their head on the surface or on the wall, on the hard, 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 hard uh, floor. So that's why you're trying to guide their head for them. Just put a, a kind of blanket. If they don't get blanket, put a thick cloth on that head so that let them be eating that head on the floor. Place the casualty on recovery position, allow plenty of waste. All conversion ceased. So the only time you can touch them is when the casualty has ceased. And these are the five series that I said they will, they will pass to. One, they are conversing, uh, once they, they have the conversion, once the, uh, they, they have been attacked by the epilepsy or when they have been attacked by that, uh, the conversion. So they have to convulse. That's when you see them jacking. They have to jack, they have to convulse. So after then, then after they've done the old process, they have to stretch. And if you if you have noticed um, a an epileptic casualty before, you understand what I'm trying to say. After they convulse, they have to stretch. So once they stretch, they will relax. So after relaxing, they will have to rest. That's when you see them, they have to sleep or rest because the process of convulsion, they have they have overgone the series of exercises on that spot because as i said the the muzzle is involuntary they are not the one controlling the muzzle anymore so the muzzle will be hyper 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 working for them so that's when they have to rest so once they rest they will recover that's that's that just this stage so once they recover then you have to place them on the proper position don't run from them don't hold them while they are convulsing don't uh, uh, just help them to clear the side, the surrounding. That's what you can do for them on the concussion. So um, I have a video here that will tell us more on concussion and see, you can see how what I just said now. In this video, you will learn to administer first aid to a person suffering a seizure. During the seizure, do not try to move them unless they are in danger. Remove any objects around them which may cause harm. Do not restrain their movements but protect them from injury by cushioning them. Do not put anything in their mouth, they will not swallow their tongue. After the seizure, if the patient is unconscious, tilt their head back to ensure that their airways are clear and check their breathing. Place them on the side in the recovery position. Make sure that they're breathing properly. Stay with them until they have fully regained consciousness. This could take several minutes. Call the emergency services and tell them if the seizure has lasted more than five minutes or there have been more than one, the patient is a child, the patient has not regained consciousness, the patient has never had a seizure before.
Oh, so thank you very much. So, uh, so another one is uh, true. Another one is true. Uh, this, this is another thing that we try to notice that like, happens at home. Maybe somebody is uh, some just uh, just uh, being attacked by stroke. And uh, how do you recognize stroke? These are the way to find stroke. The acronym say fast. So if you want to recognize stroke or you want to attempt someone that have stroke, then you have to act fast. So once you act fast, then you you, you walk up to the casualty, you check their face, you know that their face will drop, their face surely drop, and their arm, their arm, they, they will raise, they, they, like the, the stroke that we're talking about now, when we're talking about stroke, stroke is, so stroke is just a, uh, a condition of a um, blockade in their passage where um, the, the condition of a blockade in their passage where the, there is a form of blood clotting in the in the in the brain in the blood vessel that, that transport blood to the brain that to notice that one side of the body is being paralyzed. So that's just to so if you want to manage to then you keep the casualty comfortable with heads and shoulder and support. Check vital sign and level of consciousness until medical condition. So that's very important on stroke. So heart attack also is one of the um, things that we usually face at home as well. So heart attack is just a breaking in the function of the heart due to inadequate or sudden absorption of blood supplying blood to the heart because of blood clotting in the blood vessel. So heart attack is also known as, um, stroke is also known as heart attack. So the same thing that happens in, this, in the brain, that leads to stroke is the same thing that happens in the heart that leads to heart attack. So it's so so to so people that are happen to heart in the heart attack, so it's similar to the same thing to heart attack and stroke. This they are similar things, but in stroke it happens in the brain, while in heart attack it happens in the heart. So um if you want to recognize um, someone that has an attack, that's when you see a pers persistent chest pain. We see them holding their chest, that will breast a uh, breathlessness, that will be comfort, that will faintness or and guidance that will follow, that will shock, that will be weak and irregular rapid pulse, and that will collapse. That's when you see them they will, they will collapse. And if you don't attend to them first, that's when it can also it can also lead to cardiac arrest. So heart attack can also lead to cardiac arrest. So once the heart has been attacked, so these are, these are the things you have to do. You place the casualty in the half sitting position. You call the EMS. Ask the casualty to take a full dose of aspirin if they have, or before you give them aspirin, ask them if they are on any medication. Ask them, check their pocket. Check their pockets, or you ask them if they have, give them their medication to use. But if not, give them aspirin. Aspirin will help them to lighten the blood clotting. So it will let the, the, the clotting of the blood to light. That's where the function, one of the function of aspirin. So once you do that, you monitor the casualty and reassure. So you have to monitor your casualty. It's very important to monitor your casualty in case that person go. Concussion or that person develop cardiac arrest, yeah, you should be able to give your 30 chest compression and do mouth breath. That's why you have to monitor your um, casualty as at, at, at attack. So you, the main um, the main management of heart attack is just that place them in half sitting the way this man is being positioned. Then you have to give um, you have to give what's it called uh, aspirin if they have. So um, let me play a video on another attack for you. You all right with all those bags? Yeah, fine. Ahmed, what's wrong? Jess, this... I'm coming round. Ah. Sit down, sit down with me, all the way down. That's it, that's it. 
that's it. Excuse me, have you got a mobile? Can you call an ambulance? I think my friend's having a heart attack. Okay, oh, it's all right. Somebody's calling an ambulance, okay? All ambulance, right. please. And I'm gonna be here with you, okay? So it's gonna be here really soon, then we're gonna get you to the hospital. So don't worry, don't worry. And I'm gonna be right here. I'm staying right here with you, all right? Okay. It won't be long, all right? Okay. So, um, other injuries are actually up in our wound. We have uh, bleeding and wound. So, um, so bleeding is just an escape of blood from damaged blood vessels. So, maybe someone is at home, maybe in the kitchen trying to cook, and um, basically a knife has to cut that person in his hands. What are the things that person has to do? Or that is severe bleeding, and how that person is bleeding, what are the things you have to do to stop bleeding? So that's what we are trying to do now. So the management of bleeding is um, you sit that person down, you examine the, the wound, um, how you expose it, you check, then you have apply pressure, and then you have to elevate. So that's why uh, you have that's what you have. So if someone is bleeding. In this video, the main treatment for bleeding is um, to apply pressure on the other part. Once, once you apply pressure on the other part, pressure then the that person with clean will be fine. Using a plastic bag or a cloth in order to prevent any infection. Lay the casualty on their back in order to prevent them from going into shock. If you have to leave the casualty to call emergency services, ask the casualty to apply pressure themselves. Cover the casualty and monitor them until medical help arrives. So if you want to manage wounds, this is what to do once, once I'm managing wounds as well. Uh, you have to... Uh, Always gloves if you have them. Life. And first, ask the casualty to apply some pressure to the wound using a piece of gauze. Just put some pressure on there. And then raise to, the injury. You have to Next, you need to clean the wound. Then you clean. So um, put in spirits, put in iodine, Putting all sorts of um, liquid is not also welcome in first aid box anymore. So we don't and use spirit anymore. No so you have to use a wipe, aesthetic wipe, to clean the wound. Then you have to cover. Did you, the you clean the wound, then you cover. So that's just it. Remember, apply pressure, raise the injury, mm -hmm. clean and dry the cut, apply a mm -hmm. sterile dressing. If you're worried about infection, ask the casualty to seek medical advice. And that's how we... ...with gloves if you have them. And first, ask the casualty to apply some pressure to the wound. So, um, let's go to bones. Let's go to bones. So, in case someone has bones, or maybe you are in the kitchen, you are trying to cook, and you take a hot substance for on you. I know in bones, some people usually apply uh, pap, some people apply egg, some people apply honey, some people. So they are also, though, they are trying to, to form protein on the, uh, on the affected part, but it is not uh, the proper way of application of their prostate to it. So um, the only thing you can do to bones is that uh, you put the affected part, 
ensure that you place the apply part on a running water for about 10 minutes. Then you remove any any clothing that is not sticking on the on the bones. But in case of it is fire, then if um, this thing is being stuck stick on that person's body, if the clothes being stick on that person's body, please don't remove. But if it is a hot softer that is cast, maybe hot fluid, so you have to remove. Then you have to pull the apply part. Then once you pull the apply part, I have and you have to cover the apply part with a non uh, floor fixture material. That's um, the kind of a uh, Clean film. Uh, then after then you have to you have to seek medical attention. Oh. <laughs> oh, I don't believe I've just done that. Oh my arm. Here we go. First things first. Oh. Under the cold tap. Now, have you got some cling film? Uh, yeah, just in that top drawer uh, there. I'll keep it there. Out you come. That's it. Oh. Wrap it up loosely. You'll feel more comfortable too. Thank you so much. Yeah. So after this, you can now seek medical attention or you can call the emergency line 767 or you call me too. Ensure that you pull the affected part. Place that hand under your running water for at least 10 minutes. So once you've done that, so um, you have to pull the affected part. Then you have to cover the affected part so that uh, uh, jams will not stick on your. So if you notice someone has bones, please don't encourage to bust that crystal. It is very wrong once you when you bust crystal on someone that has uh, bones. If you bust the blister, the blister is going to cause wound. That means that person is going to treat wound later on. So don't bust blister. Most times, blister usually shrink back. And once it shrinks back, it will dry off and that person will be fine. So don't bust blister. Once you bust it, that person is going to treat wound. And once you bust blister as well, that person is also losing body fluid. So you are not supposed to bust any blister. Leave that blister there. And, and just pull, once you pull the cover, then you place your, take your cash out to the hospital. The crystal can shrink later and that person will be fine. So, um, injury to tissue and joint. So, injury to joint and muscle, um, we have, uh, even someone has injury to joint and muscle, especially once there is um, injury at the um, joint in the body, the ankle, the toe, the, the, the knee, the elbow and so on, or uh, any other um, muscle. Uh, hello, Mister. Yeah, please. Uh, after I this, uh, after this slide, after this uh, this injury, soft tissue injury, you can uh, pin this for now, so that we'll continue some other time because of time. So, well, the slide is about to be over. So. Okay. Thank you. So um, you just place all these, you place, you apply ice. Once you apply your eyes, we you are enjoying the class. So you rest, you rest the affected part. Once you rest the affected part, then you have to apply your eyes. You are applying your eyes on the affected part because the ice is going to shrink the affected part for you. It's not, the ice will not allow the affected part to swell. And the ice will not allow um body fluid to accumulate into the paper so that the place will not be deformed that's why you are applying ice so that's why you apply and if you are trying if you want to apply ice ensure that you wrap the ice before you apply it if you don't wrap the ice then um if you don't apply it it can cause it can lead to frostbite so that's why you have to wrap the ice so and the first 48 hours of the injury ensure that you apply ice stop you don't massage don't put all this ointment or so. Just apply ice and rub the ice on it for the first 48 hours of the injury. So once, once you've done that, then you have to compress. That's when you have to use your bandage. Then you have to elevate. The, the reason you're elevating is that you are, you are trying to let, uh, you are trying to prevent the accumulation of body fluids on the affected part. That's why you are trying to elevate the affected part up 
of the um of, of the brand that's that's why I, so the first thing you have to do is to arrest the other part they're arresting the other part from further activities they're arresting the other part from further movement or further um job then after they buy your eyes eyes is the main treatment for injury to join almost for the first 48 hours of the injury so let's assume someone has a um, strain or sprain by this time that means uh, from uh, until Tuesday of this time. After Tuesday of this time, the hair, that's when you cannot apply all those ointments or you cannot apply all those balm, usually apply it. But first for six hours, please apply ice on it. Let the other part shrink, compress, then you elevate. To bandage an ankle, use a roller bandage. Make sure you have the ankle raised and supported to start with, and then apply an ice pack and some padding. Using the roller bandage, start with the tail and put it to the inside of the foot, and then wrap it around one and a half times just to make sure that it doesn't come off. I'm just going to lift up your leg a little bit. Okay. It's important to bandage from the toes to the knee because you need to make sure that you cover from the joint before to the joint after the injury site and then just keep on going around and around. So keep on going until you get to the knee. And then if you can wrap the bandage around twice when you get to the knee and then just pin it in place. Feel okay. yep. To check circulation, squeeze the toenail for five seconds. When you let go, the colour should return within two seconds. If it doesn't, it means the bandage is too tight and you need to loosen it off and reapply it. Keep checking okay, the circulation. Thank you very much. That's that on um, the um, I think um, that is the last topic we're going to talk about now. Not sure. Um, if someone has structural things, I think you have to put in place. Structure is, is an injury to the bone, whereby the bone breaks, bend, or crack. So, any form of injury to the bone is known as fracture. So, um, these are uh, like the signs and symptoms of fracture. If you want to know someone has fracture, they have a lot of power, irregularity, pain, deformity, or natural movement, shock, and tenderness. Yeah, if you want to manage fracture, then at least that's when you have to provide support to the injured area. That's for the set of the injury. It is for when that is if there is wound, because there are some fracture that can also lead to wound. That's when the wound plays out of the skin or plays out of the, the body tissue. So it can lead to also lead to the wound. Then you have to immobilize the affected part. That is the main treatment of fracture. Immobil The ability of the affected part is casualty. So always be assure your casualty and monitor your casualty. Always tell them sorry. Please tell them they will soon be fine. Tell them they will be okay. Tell them everything will be fine. Everything will be in good. That's you are trying to keep them a sign of hope, a sign of life. So let's now talk Body about uh, fracture. Let's 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 try to talk about uh, fracture at the uh, what's it called at the at the limb. Like the, the upper limb of the hand. Um, All these signs of shock. If you think you've broken a bone, support the injured part to stop it from moving. This should help ease the pain and prevent any further damage. Place padding around the injury for extra support. If it's an open fracture, cover the wound with a sterile dressing and secure it with a bandage. Apply pressure around the wound and not over the protruding bone to control any bleeding. Call 999 or 112 for emergency help. While you're waiting for help to arrive, don't move the casualty unless they're in immediate danger. Support the injured area. For example, fractures on the arm can be secured against the body with a sling.
The fracture to the leg can be secured to the uninjured leg with a triangular bandage. Keep checking the person for signs of shock, but do not raise an injured leg. If necessary, raise the uninjured leg. If they become unresponsive at any point, prepare to treat an unresponsive casualty. So remember, pad and support the injured area. Use a sling or triangular bandage to keep it secure. So, uh, Cover any thank wounds. you very much. Uh, that's that on fracture as well. Um, in case of any injury to, to the bones, ensure that you are trying to suspend the affected part from moving. That's the only thing I think on fracture. So thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate your time and I have to also apologize for the technical issue we faced. Um, at the start of the class. I'm very sorry for that. Uh, I have to take that blame. So please, I'm very sorry for that. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate your time. I appreciate your patience and I appreciate everything. Um, I appreciate the data you use to, to attend this class. And, uh, in case of any question, <laughs> any review, of any question, if there is anything, uh, if there is anything we not discuss at all and you want to ask as well, please feel free to ask. Is any emergency at all that you uh, can feel free to ask your question now? Um, we are here to, to give um, just a report to your questions. Thank you very much. So, uh, Mr. Wadi, so please go back to me, sir. Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Ayeni. It's really, really been a wonderful moment, even though we had some earlier issues with network and um, with patience and resilience. I think we've been able to manage the situation. And um, we have also have wonderful participants who have been patient with us all through. Uh, may, I know, may I please note to... to uh, not to everyone, to mostly some of us who kept asking questions why the, why the pastor was going on. There's always time for questions. And the, if we start answering every question that you ask why we are having the training, then we are only going, we're going to waste more time. We've been seeing a lot of questions, a lot of, um, uh, especially some are questions why some are rhetorical questions. In which I would I would have um, tried to I have wish to elaborate and emphasize, and some of them, uh, one of them, no one of them that was asked, uh, um, one time is in most cases people that convert actually get to recovery position. So how then can we put them in in a recovery position? They are, they get to recover quickly. When they recover from their conversion, they are they are always tired and weak. And a lot of things that happen within that period of time. So putting them at in a recovery position, in that position will actually make them to gain more energy and rest well. Rest well so that they will be able to uh, get back to their normal life. And I think that is the recovery position should be for conversion to be after the person has recovered from the conversion. Yes, when the person uh, the person the muscles are not shaking again. There are so many other ones that I would have loved to respond to, but we think that you have um, some questions, especially about AED, uh, auto. Okay, do you have questions? Yeah, there were some questions along the line, but well, okay, and uh, another question was okay, saying please. That, okay, another question was saying that placing on one side, as you said, is it any of the any of the side? Is it the right side or the left side? When you're talking about recovery position, is it the right okay. side or the left side? You place the recovery position in any of the sides. Any of the side. Okay, very good. If one is alone, how do you give chest compression and still set up the debilitator? Now, this is this is a rhetorical question. Because when you're talking about first aid, you're talking about first aid training, you're talking about giving help to someone, not the person giving help to himself. So generally speaking, this, this question is not relevant. Because you are talking about giving up to someone, now you are asking if the person is alone. So this question is not relevant to first aid. When someone is unconscious, how can the person give first aid to himself in the first place? So no matter, unconscious. Yeah, no. If, 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 the person, if the person is alone, 
If the person is alone okay. and is unconscious, how can, how can a, the person give himself first aid? Is it possible? How can the person give okay. himself first aid when the woman is unconscious? First aid on unconsciousness. No, it's not possible. It's not possible. So, so the possible. question, so whether the AED or CPR is, the question is irrelevant. The, the only thing that person can do is that if you notice that something is coming up, you can usually call um, help, emergency line, and um, so once you've done that, you've given yourself first aid. Calling emergency line is also first aid. It's not compulsory you tie. Like I said the other time, when we started, I said it's not compulsory you start tying or start bandaging before you give yes. first aid. Yeah. Lending help, calling for help, telling someone sorry. It's also it's also a means of first aid. So yeah. um, if you notice that something is about to come up and just try to call the emergency line and let them try to um call come on time and something will uh, something can still happen. Or you call for help. Call your colleague, you can chat to your someone that I'm feeling so mad and I don't know what's going to happen in the next five minutes. Once you call me, I don't respond. That means something is happening. Please help me to call so 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 like that's all. So that's that's first thing. You are trying to keep yourself first aid too. So okay, so someone also said uh, that uh, AED is not in Nigeria. AED is available in Nigeria. Standard organizations have it. It's just that at home, it might not be practicable at home. So if, but if you have it, it's good for you if you have it at home. If you have it, okay, you have, if you have it at home, sir. it's good for you. For AED. Um, Mr. Mr. Yeah. Walu. Sir? AED, AED, AED. They can also have AED. It's also applicable at home as well. Exactly what I'm saying. Are, exactly people that stay in their states. You can just tell your estate management that okay, let us have this thing at a very accessible part. Maybe every block, every maybe um, they know how to just try to run the put that and that money and place it in a accessible place in your estate. It will be fine. Like the view that I showed the other time, you notice that it was even on the on on the wall where they pick it, and anybody can just pick the aid. That's how it is supposed to be. Not aid, not some something that you have one and. We have to start locking um, the key, locking the the access of 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 the, of the AD. It's, it's so very let's, so let, let's, let's very All right, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Gabriel also said, "How many first aiders has AED?" This question, I think, this is a training session and, and not a session to criticize or ostracize. It's a session where we are all open to learning. How many first aiders have AED doesn't mean that we shouldn't train ourselves about AED. It doesn't mean we should not educate ourselves about AED. AED is part of the training that first aiders should also have. So he said, let us learn practicable things, practical first aid in Nigeria. You might not have been able to practice it because maybe you don't have it or you don't have access to it. But we have first aiders in Nigeria that have access to AED. Okay. We have trainers in Nigeria that have access to AED. Now, the person also said, do we even have normal first aid box? If you don't have normal first aid box, please let us try and have one in every home. Let us train our kids on first aid, on basic things. We've, we've seen videos of, we've seen videos gone viral of those who help their family members who got involved in maybe uh, in first aid situations like um, someone who, there was one that I watched, I think the person had that attack. And it was a family member that was around that helped the person. If there was no one to help, the person would have died now. Then the Mr. Dover also said the issue of counting also is not practicable too in an emergency situation. I, I want you to talk on that, Mr. Mr. Ayeni. He said the issue of counting also, counting uh, when you have been CPR, maybe or I think I think AED or CPR, I think both that the issue of counting is not okay. practicable. Please, it is possible. It is very possible because while you are counting, you are counting in your mind. And you are giving, um, your, your compression should be two times in a second. That means if you are trying to give your chest compression, yeah, in, in 15 minutes, you must have completed, in, sorry, in 15 seconds, you must have completed your chest compression. You, are, you can count it inside. The only way that I can, I can just accept that you might not be able to count your chest compression is that when you are not giving too much weight, then you can just continue your chest compression without any 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 counting. But if you are stopping to give too much weight, and the reason you are giving too much weight is that once you've done your chest chest compression, the, you are trying to compress the heart so that the heart will start working. And you are giving too much weight. You are stopping to give too much weight because you are trying to give oxygen into the lungs. Because CPR means cardio pulmonary resuscitation. 
Cardio is the heart. You are compressing the heart. Pulmonary is the lungs. So the lungs also needs oxygen. That's why you are blowing in uh, into the person's mouth. And the resuscitation is the revival you are trying to do. That's why it's known as cardiopulmonary resuscitation. So your two mouth breath is also work by the time you give oxygen to the lungs. You're blowing air into the lung, into the person's mouth, it's going into the lungs. That's why you have to count your 30, then you choose. So you can count. If you can you can count because um I'm a I'm a first aider and I'm um and I'm an emergency responder. So I I'm very like we'll be comparable to that. Though I've done like two to three CPL to someone before, like we like not even in lecture, not even lecture this time. Like I've done two to three just compression to someone and without I counted and I, okay. I make it up with. All right. Uh, Mr. Udibo Emmanuel Abad says, said that he said if the first aider is alone. Also, part of the procedure that we said is that when you see someone is in a emergency situation, you also ask for help. You start calling for help for people to come around. But you can't say because you are alone Therefore, as the first aider. Yeah, senior one. You can't say you can't. I respect you. Good evening, please. Wait, Everything sir, fine. Please, please. You can't say because when I'm done, then you have the floor. I'm you can't telling say you. Because you are alone. <laughs> You are What's alone. Happening? Then you can't do anything. At least you do something before you now get okay. to help you. No, no, no. Hello. Yeah, yeah, we are here. We are here. We are here. Yes. Can yes. you hear me? Yes, can yes, yes, yes. Hello. Yes. Continue. Continue. Hello. Okay. Uh, Mr. Mana also said, Mr. Can you hear me, Mr. 